so much for joining today. And I just wanted to, first of all, explain why it was that I asked you uh, to join. So lately, there have been so many questions from financial leaders, um, a lot of, many of which are your peers. You know them from the CFO Leadership Council. We have a lot of mutual friends. And there's been a lot of questions about automation um, and, and how do we apply it and what do we do and what is a bot? And when should a bot have AI? And what is the difference between those? And how much am I supposed to know? And it's sort of become this, this overwhelming conversation um, about automation being business-led, not so much an IT initiative, but more on the business side. And since many of the use cases, right, in, in my world from where I sit start in accounting, for example, um, it's always been my theory that the CFO should drive it too. So it's interesting that these two philosophies are kind of converging, and I thought it made sense to invite you uh, to, to record a few answers that, that we can you know, help our CFO friends with um, and understand that they're not alone in this journey of understanding automation. So um, thanks so much, and, and I'll kick it off by asking you, is that true in your opinion? Uh, has the role of the CFO changed? Do they think about these things more? Or are we seeing some heightened response with automation because of COVID? Is this here to stay or is it hype? And, and that's, that, that's a great point, thank you. I think COVID has not stopped things, right? I think historical data has lost some of its importance. While historical information is important, and for certain areas such as reporting, for SEC reporting and tax, doesn't add a great deal of value. So what you would need is the real value add is real-time data about how things are trending in your business, what your profit is, what your revenue is on a real-time basis. And one of the things I'm getting involved in or trying to do is what I'll call in continuous reporting, continuous accounting. And that is greatly aided by bots. I think the reason why this is a big topic for CFOs is because in the future, you're going to need to make an investment to be into real-time data. And you need to be able to generate insights into the businesses so that the business leaders, both inside and outside of the, the, the company, meaning the board and maybe the investors, um, can respond real-time to where the organization may be. No longer will we be just satisfied with allowing the accountants to pull together historical financial data. It's of no relevance, and there's no more competitive advantage to do, to do so. If I close the books and, and, and I get historical information 15 to 20 days into a month that is previously closed, it does me no good. It does the business no good. No, agreed completely. And, and you know, to that point, so the ascension of, of the controller to CFO, sort of that, that career track, is including more and more of these recs or requirements or understanding of, of technology. And interestingly enough, things like robotic process automation, um, you know, and having FP&A analysts that can do kind of some low code process development work, for example. And I, and I never thought I'd see the day that that would be a, you know, that'd be a, a bullet nice to have, you know, on an accounting, um, you know, a, a finance and accounting. Usually it's the specialized roles, right? Um, and so so to that point, um, you know, I, I know in your role of leadership, you've definitely been responsible for, for hiring several, you know, types of talent. Are these some of the things that you're looking at uh, as far as as far as your future hires, aptitude and technology? Is that something that's really kind of converging in your eyes too? I think we have to. I think the people who have, for example, been out of school within the last 10, 15 years or so, they're more of a digital generation. And they collaborate in different ways more than maybe some of their seasoned colleagues are. I think in the past also, I've given great weight, for example, to people who had exceptional skills in, in Excel or in spreadsheets, linked files, running macros. That skill set has really been valuable and vital in the last 20, 25 years, but I no longer need it as much. I don't want to be in that business anymore. I don't want to be in the business where I just have one person who knows all of Excel, puts together the macros, and takes all of their time doing that. That's a full-time full employee that can be doing things other than just running macros. They could be analyzing the data. So I want them to be able to ensure not only the integrity of the of the historical reporting, but also to provide what I call actionable data to management. So that means it's a good partnership with the CFO, the CEO, and the real and, and the whole C-suite, including each business leader. That information needs to be provided real time. And the only way to do that is to look to hire people with a different type of skill set. 
good accountants, analytical, but yet are tech savvy. I agree completely. And, and, you know, we've always said, and you know, that my background is in process improvement. It's always been about looking at the people, the systems and, and understanding where the technology and the, and the folks should converge. Um, you know, with the advent of RPA, essentially being a capability added to an organization, right? These, these software robots, um, you know, that wind up, you know, being digital workers and really performing functions. That is a change management thing, right? That's something that, that really takes wrapping your arms around it, really getting that C-suite to understand, buy in, you know, make sure that we're kind of all on the vision path together. Um, and, and so how have you found the best way of introducing that and really understanding that the stakeholder alignment needs to be there for, you know, new technologies like this? And, and that is the biggest challenge. The being able to provide the return on investment to your board, to your CEO, is vital. And, and why? Because I think in the last, call it 10 years or so, companies may have put in new systems. They may have put in a new ERP. They may have invested into the infrastructure and the technology systems, but have still not received what they want. I had a, my, my previous CEO said to me, I want to be able to open up my phone and know at any time what my what my profit is, where I stand, what my financial position is. He said, listen, I spent millions. How come I can't have that? So now going to your board again, going to your decision makers and having to explain yet again why this might be better if something has failed in the past becomes difficult. So change management is extremely um, extremely important, extremely vital. The way you need to present it is to show that return on your investment to be able to, to, to integrate it in certain areas. And if I may, I can give a few examples that I'm, I'm familiar with. I would love that. No, I think that'd be super helpful because I think the, the hands-on, you know, help me understand it is, is the best way to help our, our CFO friends. So one of the more difficult or, or complex, listen, we've heard about how it can be done in invoice processing and accounts payable. I can go through that. Where I found one of, something that was really helpful, still being tested, but is extremely helpful is on the client side, the customer side. So I may have a customer that is paying a, an invoice that may be for multiple services. And I may have, um, trying to have a bot that can go in and um, read the payment instructions and split it into a service, a sale of a product, or, or whatever, whatever uh, it may be. And that split can process um, a journal entry and it can work in any system because you see the flip side of what the accountant is, right, doing. You see the flip side of what the money is doing. Um, so, so being able to see it from the customer perspective for a CFO is a very novel concept. Um, you know, one that I think will help, you know, kind of evangelize this notion that I have that RPA is the great equalizer of business units. You know, it's truly the way that you can cross you know, cross functionally get stuff done more efficiently, I think. Um, you know, <laughs> Yeah. I th no, that's no that I, I so I think you made a great point because you're showing that the CFO is supposed to be caring about the customer. That's not just the chief revenue officer's job. That's not just the head of sales job. Right. Like you as the CFO, you see the health of the organization. You can see when clients leave better than the salespeople can. I bet, you know, if you had the right financial data, you'd see the implication of what moves that they make affect the bottom line. Um, you know, if the data is actionable and, and, you know, robots are really, really um, nimble implementation to get that really powerful data in a, in a visual kind of format. You're absolutely right. I think that was a great example. Do you have another example of something that, you know, that, that could potentially be automated or, or another thing that you kind of thought through that's a practical application of this outside of the use cases we've all heard? Sure. And related to, to, to what I just mentioned within the order to cash cycle, you know, it, selling this to your decision makers can be a little bit easy because of what I mentioned earlier, meaning there may be different legacy systems that are in place that don't really talk to each other that really aren't integrated. But I have, for example, I have to do multiple reconciliations between um, the original order, the SLA with the customer, the data that comes out of the billing system then creating invoices and matching and ensuring it appropriately hits our revenue system and our related ERP. We now have a bot that would be able to um, 
take out all of those steps in the process and provides me with a customized daily report that I can be able to see and review and test for internal controls and governance. It takes out a lot of the manual work that, that people were doing, that staff were, were doing. Um, and again, it, it provides me with something that I can get an automated email at a specified time, don't have to enter into a billing system or review, don't have to rely on my reconciliations. I can reduce my internal controls because of this bot. And again, at a global institution, this is absolutely invaluable, especially if you have multiple legacy systems. Oh, absolutely. Uh, one of my favorite things, you know, is is it's actually bypassed integrations at times um, because of that, since you're just sucking the input data straight from, you know, straight from the source instead of having to rely on what humans have to rely on, which is, you know, which is GUIs and interfaces, um, platform kind of pictures, uh, you know, uh, and so, so going straight to the source is the best way. So another great use case. Um, so you are certainly proving my point, right, that the more CFOs know about bots, the more they can help kind of facilitate this cross-functional efficiency gain, um, understanding the health of the organization to recommend, right, to make recommendations for the future and, and have kind of some proactive vision as a result of this actionable data that you've now kind of, kind of done. You've also freed up resources and you've also built a capability in that could potentially be, you know, an attrition beater, um, you know, that could potentially be a, a way to proactively uh, not have to hire, think through some way of having a digital workforce for a new function if the company were to grow, um, having a proactive solution to integrations if there's a future merge, right? And just having that capability there and knowing that it can kind of tangle its webs, you know, it, it kind of weave its way through, through the different tubes of, of process really makes it that much more powerful. So when you're thinking about technology from the perspective of ROI, right, really, really understanding what is what it's going to take for that tech investment that's usually a little heavy up front for it to actually match some sort of material gain, right, and that there's an outcome that you can apply back to that investment. Um, however that is, if it's full-time equivalents, if it's cash, if it's, uh, you know, the elimination of a department, it's, it's, it's all different kinds of ways. But how is it that you go about determining, right, what that measure of a win looks like um, and aligning on that? Because I heard you say something about risk, which made me think of the fact that it could very much be as simple as not getting dinged by an auditor next year. You know, that could be a great reason to build a $40,000 automation, right? To avoid a, God knows how much it could be, you know, fine. So there's several ways to measure ROI, right? So getting a handle on that has been something that's been difficult for RPA adopters to do. So what is your advice on how to think through the measure, you know, the measurement of where your gains are to make sure that the investment that you make in the technology is actually gonna have an, out, an outcome that's, that's material to the organization? Uh, and, and that's that again. That, that's the that's the challenging question here. I think you often will come up to a brick wall of organizational resistance. And I think one of the ways you look at it is what you just mentioned: risk. I think bots and AI can help reduce risk, not not add risk. So the future finance function, right? It's here. I have to think forward. The future finance function. We're going to be more focused on managing um, our strategic risk digitally. We're going to be using what we call predictive analytics. We're using that in certain areas now, but that would help us investigate any implications of any strategic decisions, um, plan for any unusual circumstances that may come up, and, and of course, more importantly, mitigate the threat of, of cyber risk. I think security and the advantage of bots can increase cybersecurity. That's certainly something that's been a big issue for us uh, in a, for a long time. I think you can integrate much of this with firewalls and blockchain systems. So to ensure that the cyber criminal uh, criminality can be reduced somewhat. So I think from the risk perspective, I think there's a, a lot of potential there that needs to be untapped, um, needs to be tapped. And then we talk a bit about cost. One of the things that I, I, I usually struggle with is the outsourcing structure, right? Um, every, almost every place I've been in the last 10 years or so, when I talk about the procure to pay, the accounts payable team, I hear, well, let's just outsource. And I've, I've been on both sides. And I think the traditional offshore model, it's, it's, it no longer works. I think even though it, it may seem as cheap labor, it's still not cheap. It's not cheap anymore. 
because guess what? Some of these folks that we're outsourcing to are, are in demand. They're in great demand and they have really good skill set. So now we need to look for alternatives for something that is maybe more, uh, certainly more cost effective, but even more efficient. There's not a, an implication or there's not a, a chance of having human error. So I think those are some of the, the, the key things um, that we have here. And then finally, I think my overall approach would be to slowly shift the organization to automate manual processes. I've been, again, a, a, on, a, on a side where we've tried to throw everything at once and it's, it's failed. But if you're, if, you're, if you're slowly bringing the company there, you are ensuring that the analytics and the risk mitigation are the key factors that, you're, that you have here. And you continue on hiring people with the basis of skills that are needed that can complement the bots. I think then that's what we're looking forward to in the future. And that's just going to make us more nimble and more efficient. I couldn't have said it better. Well, with that, thank you so much for uh, for helping tell that story much more eloquently than I could. Um, and I think uh, all of our friends at the CFO Leadership Council and beyond will be really grateful for this information.